I'm going to briefly introduce Scott. You've all read that he's an emeritus professor of geology, which explains his great interest in terroir. Um, there's lots of things I could say about Scott. We've known each other for a long time, um, but I want to first welcome the Wine Zoomers. This is our first ever Wine Zoom. And um, as I said earlier, this is what we used to call when we met in person, enrichment activities. So, um, so I'm Pat Squire. If, if you don't know me, I'm the program VP for AAUW Oregon. And this is the first session of our annual conference uh, with other meetings to come next week. So Scott knows a lot of things about, a, a lot about a lot of things. I consider him a Renaissance man. Uh, you may have seen him on TV talking about landslides or earthquakes. And of course, uh, he taught many different kinds of classes on geology. Um, one that has been popular with a lot of people our age was one that he did on national parks. Uh, so he, he's widely read, he's widely known. He loves opera, he loves sports. And most importantly for us tonight, he loves wine. <laughs> uh, he studied wine all over the world. In fact, one time he had a sabbatical to study soil in New Zealand. And Scott, as I recall, you were elected to some big important office uh, internationally for geology and you didn't end up taking that sabbatical. Um, he's led many wine tours. He's given many talks, including a couple of years ago, I asked him to do a talk for Lake Oswego Reads on the rising seas in Louisiana. So that tells you how, how broadly uh, he's studied. So tonight he's gonna talk about terroir, what it means, and then he's gonna talk to us about what we're tasting and enjoying. That is a picture of me in 1973 when they, uh, they um, dedicated the yearbook to me uh, at the American College of Switzerland. And those are the, some of the bottles of wine that we made that year. So I've been doing this ever since that time. Uh, I started drinking wine when I was at Stanford. We would go up to this fledgling new area called the Napa Valley. And you'd be able to do the whole thing in one day from one from Mondavi and Sebastiani at one end to Charles Krug and uh, Christian Brothers at the end. Now it takes you a month to do maybe 5% five, five of the valley. So it is, uh, so that's what my background in wine. So what is this crazy term ter terroir? Uh, I'm taking part of uh, Switzerland, so je parle un petit peu de français de temps en temps. And, and terroir was a uh, word that we used a lot to describe the flavor of the wine. And I define it as the taste of the place. And wherever you are in the world, the wines of the, that particular area will have a certain flavor based on the terroir. Uh, and uh, Oh, this is good. And, and so, and every time you go to the store and buy a bottle of wine, it, one bottle is going to be different from the next to the next based on eight different things. Number one, the grape and a Cabernet Sauvignon and a Pinot Noir and a Chardonnay. They're all going to be different because of the grapes here in the, in Oregon, where we have 12 different clones of, um, of, uh, Pinot Noir. Uh, we also get into the, the clones that you have got. Secondly, the geology is very important because what comes out of the ground uh, through the soils is going to give you the certain 10 macronutrients, six micronutrients that are necessary for the, for the flavors. Thirdly, climate is huge. And I'll come back to the climate in a second. Soil hydrology in the Willamette Valley, we don't irrigate. And so therefore you need to have enough silt and clay in the soil in order to have water at the end of the season. And then physiography, you want to maximize the heat units. And so therefore, you want to have a south facing slope less than 1,500 feet in elevation. Otherwise, the grapes do not ripen. All of those things will affect the soil biota, the nematodes, trematodes, the, um, the bacteria, the fungi that is in the soil. That gives the flavor to the wines. That is terroir. If you, I used to live in New Zealand. Uh, and uh, if you... Uh, if you ever have any of their Sauvignon Blanc from the, uh, from the north end of the South Island, it doesn't matter what the winery is, they all taste the same. Why? Because it's the terroir. Now, there are two other factors that will affect the flavors, and that's the winemaker. The winemaker has to choose between, you know, what, uh, 
what it, uh, do you uh, use uh, oak on it or not? And if you use oak, you use French oak or American oak or Hungarian oak, what type of yeast do you use? Do you use malolactic fermentation? They can really change the flavors of the wine. Uh, and then lastly, the vineyard management. Do the rows go north and south? Do they go east and west? Do you cultivate in between? Do you, do you plow in between? Or do you, what type of trellises do you use? All of those are very important. So the terroir is the total elements of the vineyard, the bedrock geology, the soils, the climate, and everything. And the, as I mentioned, the taste of the place. It's best expressed in cool climate grapes like Pinot Noir, Riesling, and Chardonnay. Now, we're also using that term for other things like coffee. Uh, and you always look to see where it is from because it's going to have a different terroir. Hops. Uh, if you are a brewmaster, you will always list where your hops came from. I gave a talk in upstate um, uh, Vermont. And they say, oh, yeah, we have terroir of maple syrup. It cheeses exactly the same way. And at Portland State, we've started a new program in the terroir of marijuana. Uh, or weed, we've always known which valleys in southwest Oregon produce the, the, the best weed, but what are the characteristics that you have got? Dick Erath, one of the, one of the guys who started uh, the wine industry in Oregon, said 80% of the quality comes from the vineyard. He is a terroirist. 20% is coming from the winery uh, and the winemaker. So if we look at most of the, let's go back to climate, for instance. If we look at most of the vineyards that are found in the world today, they are 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude for the Vitus vinifera, which is the major type of, of wine uh, that we drink today. The United States, all of Europe, and all the way over to China, which is, also produces huge amounts of wine. South America, you've got Chile, uh, Mendoza, Argentina, South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand, uh, all in that same area. If we go back to Burgundy, modern winemaking has taken off. Uh, there, uh, there's a line that goes right through uh, just north of Cognac, south of Burgundy. Above that is cool climate. And Burgundy is basically equivalent to the Willamette Valley that we have got. We are the Burgundy of North America. And then you get down into Bordeaux, the Rhone, uh, Provence, that is into intermediate warm. It's a warmer climate, different types of grapes. It, if you went to France and had a bottle of wine, it will tell you the name of the wine, the winery they got, the year, the alcoholic concentration, but it never tells you what type of grapes are in there. Why? Because you're supposed to understand the terroir. If it's red and from Burgundy, you know it's going to be Pinot Noir. If it's white and from Burgundy, you know it's going to be a Chardonnay. Uh, and if it's red and from Beaujolais, you know it's going to be a Gamay Noir. Uh, and so here is the equivalent of the Willamette Valley. This is Burgundy. But the, the bedrock is mostly limestone and marl, which is different than we, what we have in the Willamette Valley. Geologists have gone into uh, the Burgundy area, and they, they, they know that there is a line above which it doesn't matter who the winemakers are, the best grapes are always going to be grown there. And that's called the Grand Cru, and they put that on the, the wine, wine labels. And then you have Premier Cru, that's the next best. And then as you go down the slope, then it's the Van Ordinaire or Ordinary Wine. And so they have looked at, in Burgundy, the geology. And so here is the line between Premier Cru uh, and down here and Grand Cru, which is up above. And this is primarily marl, which is a dirty limestone. This is pure limestone. So the geology is what dominates what the best wines are, not who the winemaker happens to be. And down at the bottom, you have river deposits. Uh, and so Vitus vinifera is the particular wine that we make most of our grapes from. And you know the names Riesling and Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, etc. And let's go back to this climate thing. If Greg Jones is probably the world's greatest wine climatologist. He ran the wine program down at Linfield for many, many years. Now he is running the family winery in Southern Oregon. And you have cool climate grapes, intermediate warm, warm and hot. And so cool climate grapes are uh, the, the Willamette Valley, for instance, uh, and then Loire Valley, Burgundy, for instance, in France. Intermediate warm is uh, Southern Oregon, uh, and it is Eastern Washington. It is Chile. Uh, it is the Beaujolais area of Burgundy. 
And then warm is the Napa and Sonoma Valleys, Margaret River in Australia, Chianti in Italy, uh, and, and northern Portugal. And then when you get uh, into hot areas, that is Australia, uh, southern Portugal, and low dive. Uh, and and so what and so I put on the top using Greg's uh, 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 information. Uh, you have cool climate, intermediate warm, warm and hot. And so what are the grapes that you uh, normally grow in cool climates? And it is going to be the Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Chardonnay, and then the German style ones: Mueller Turgau, Eritrometer, and Riesling. As you get into the intermediate warm, then you start getting into the Tempranillos. Cool Climate Syrah, and then the Cabs Merlots and Syrahs. And then into the Warms, that is the big heavy reds. And then you get over into the hot, that is the Zinfandel, Nebbiola, and then Raisins uh, that you have got in those particular areas. Um, and, and so, as I mentioned before, the best transparent grapes for tasting differences in the terroir are Riesling, Chardonnay, and Pinot Noir. The, the heavier varieties over mask all of the flavors that you got. So if you want to become a wine producer, what do you do? You want to make sure you have 180 frost-free days a year. You want very few nutrients. Like when you, I grow a garden, I, I actually add fertilizer to it. You, as a winemaker, you never fertilize the, the vineyard. You want to just stress those grapes so they put all the nutrients into the grapes and, and not into the leaves and stems. You want to have well-drained soils. You want it to maximize everything. You will have a south-facing slope, seven to eight degrees to maximize the heat units you got. You want to be generally above 15 or 1,200 feet elevation. Otherwise, the grapes just don't ripen to get that 23, 24 bricks or 23, 24% sugar. And you don't want to have a lot of frost. Uh, and you get that generally in the valley bottoms. Uh, Illinois Valley down in southwest Oregon has a big problem with that. And then you don't want the temperatures to get below negative 15 degrees Fahrenheit because it kills the plant. Uh, now, you need to have certain macronutrients. I'm not going to go into all of these in depth in the soils and micronutrients that you got. And if you don't have them, then it will uh, cause problems. The, the leaves will be yellowish and, and light greenish instead of dark green. A lot of times it goes back to a deficiency in boron and molybdenum. Uh, and a lot of times you'll have to do a spray to add a little bit of that to, uh, for the, the plants to grow properly. Uh, but cal uh, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, those are coming out of the water and out of the carbon dioxide. So those are a couple of those essential macronutrients that you have got. Classic uh, taste test was done by Terry Wright, a good friend of mine who teaches at uh, Sonoma State. Well, he's now passed away, but he did. And he compared two vineyards, Vineyard A and Vineyard B. And these are uh, Iron Horse Vineyards in Sebastopol, up in the, uh, um, uh, just north of, uh, uh, of the, the, the um, uh, Cal State um, uh, campus that they have there in the Sonoma Valley, okay? Uh, and these are primary Pinot Noir grapes. Vineyard A, the soils were very clay rich, and so the, the flavors came out deep cherry color, uh, deep berry, and deep cherry cola flavors. But in Vineyard B, much lighter, a lot less clay, and lighter colors, lighter berry taste, softer tannins. When they did a taste test, everybody loved the Vineyard B. And it was the same winemaker, same year, everything was the same, same clones. The only difference was the soil. That is terroir tasting, where you keep all of those factors the same, except uh, the, the parent material. Uh, here is an area that I've done some research down in Argentina. Uh, this is um, the land of Malbec that is down there uh, there in Argentina. And the, the whole story there are the big alluvial fans coming off of the Andes. This is Mendoza. This is Aconcagua, the highest volcano that you have got there in the Andes. And what we found is the highest terraces, which have the greatest amount of caliche, had the best... Uh, best grapes uh, and de best terroir and best flavors that you have got uh, in those particular grapes. Down in Australia, the soils are red, red, red. The older the soils, the redder the soils that you have got down there. Uh, and they're very famous for their heavy reds down in that area. So to end with, what I want to do is come back to Oregon and talk a little bit about Oregon grapes that we have got. David Lett was one of the three winemakers 
uh, that got winemaking in Oregon started in the early, uh, in the 1960s. And these three winemakers came up from uh, California, from UC Davis, and they wanted to grow Pinot Noir. And he started Irie Vineyard. Uh, and he started producing some very, very pe good Pinot Noirs. He took it in 1975, his grapes and his wines, and entered it in the International Pinot Noir Competition. Uh, now, he didn't win, but he got one of the highest awards there. And normally, it's all going to be Burgundy that is winning everything. And the French were saying, just to say, Oue, Oregon, what is going on here? Where is this Oregon? Why are they producing some very, very good wines? Well, that started the recognition for Oregon at that time. So he and two other people started planting vineyards in 1961. Uh, today we have uh, over 900 wineries and over over 1,300 vineyards. There are uh, over 300 or 400 uh, people who are farmers. They produce the grapes and sell them to different uh, wineries. Um, there was a great article in the Oregonian just this past week about uh, women-oriented winemaking in the Helioterra, which is a winemakers complex in the Portland area of only women winemakers. And there's some great ones. They have four ones there uh, and, and award-winning wines that are there. And so they buy their grapes from these vineyards that uh, are not making wines from. Uh, the ratio in Oregon is 70% red, 30% white, with 59% of the total actually being Pinot Noir uh, that we have got. And so let's just come back to the Willamette Valley just for a few minutes. And so Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Noir, the Riesings, Mueller, Turgal, Gewürztraminer, and uh, Chardonnay are the major grapes grown here because we are a cool climate. Uh, now, the number of wineries is, in the United States, California leads the pack with over, uh, actually it's over 5,000 wineries now, but the number two state is Washington, and we are number three uh, that we have got, and then followed by New York and Texas. But when it comes down to percentage of, of, of ones you have, Washington, uh, New York passes it by. Why? Because they have two major uh, wine producers there, Ripple and Manischewitz. Uh, and they, they kind of rise up past us. But when we come to quality, we are producing some great ones. And then Washington, because they are number uh, uh, two in the number of wineries, they also have uh, a lot of uh, big wineries that are up there too. Uh, and, and, and so the effect on our, uh, uh, on our total economy in Oregon, $7 billion every year. Uh, and that's the hotels, the tasting rooms, um, everything, re uh, restaurants that are related with wine country. Uh, and so we have got those 900 wineries, 41 varieties that we plant in the state, actual $673 million in annual sales. That is of just of the grapes that we have got. And just last year, we had seven of the top 100 wines in the world in Wine Spectator listed there. So we are doing very, very well here in Oregon. There is the Pinot Noir grape, the king or the queen of the grapes of the valley. Now, we have all of these, what we call AVAs. And we have now, I got to update this, we have 21 American Viticultural Association areas. Uh, those are areas defined by terroir, the climate, the soils, the geology that you have got. The Willamette Valley is the biggest one. Now it's subdivided now into 10 subdivisions. Uh, the people in the Dundee area said, we have volcanic soils. We want to put that Dundee Hills on our uh, labels. And then the people in Yamhill County said, yay, we want to put it because we have mainly marine sediment soils. We want to put that on. Aeola Hills said, hey, we have primarily volcanic soils, but we also have the effect of the wind coming in from uh, the Van Duzer Corridor into Salem, uh, and it cools down everything. So it's a combination of climate and soils. Uh, and then Shehala Mountains said, no, we want to put that on there. And then there's a little Ribbon Ridge, which is up there, number four. They have primarily uh, marine sediments, but higher elevations. Uh, and, and so and, and we have now, the latest one is uh, Long Tom, which is down here uh, east of Eugene. 
And then you have got the Umpqua Valley, which in the northern part is cool climate. The southern part is intermediate warm. And then you have the northern rogue, which is warm. The southern rogue, which is intermediate warm. And then you have Illinois Valley, which is down here at Cave Junction. And that is cool climate. You go up into the gorge. And in the gorge, you have got um, cool climate in, in the Hood River area and warm climate over in the eastern end. And then up here on the boundary in between uh, uh, in the Walla Walla Valley, up there, number 15, you have the Rocks of Milton Freewater, which has an interesting um, uh, geology. It's bottom land, but it's just like Bordeaux, and they are producing the best Syrahs in the United States. So those are some of the areas that I'm hoping some of you are going to be having wines from those particular areas, too. Just back to the Willamette Valley, when we, in the early 90s, we started uh, uh, looking at what soils produce the best uh, wines. Nobody knew. Nobody knew their soils. And so I had a graduate student uh, who started, ended up having her thesis, and then we've developed ever since. And so these are the number of acres uh, that we did in our initial study. We're going to be updating the numbers, but the, uh, the ratio of them is not going to be changing. The Jory, which is the name from the Soil Conservation Service, um, Willa Kenzie and Laurel Wood were the three major soils that you've got. Jory is primarily on basalt, so volcanic soils. And the last term that is there is the scientific name for soils. Ultasol means highly weathered. Uh, and in fact, the alpha sol, which is the other two, is also highly weather weathered, but a little bit higher nutrients in it. Willa Kenzie is primarily willa, uh, sedimentary types of soils, uplifted uh, marine sediments. And laurel wood is from primarily around the Tualatin Valley. Uh, and it is uh, primarily basalt soils, but it also has windblown silt and it's weathered over 100,000 years into little piezolites. Those are the three major soil types that are there. Uh, and so here is the Willamette Valley. Uh, and so the uplift of marine sediments are basically coast range sediments. Uh, and then the, uh, where did the volcanic soils come from? Not from the Cascades. It is Columbia River basalts and where Oregon, Washington, and Idaho come to over here between 15 and 18 million years ago, you had the movement, uh, a, a whole bunch of, of uh, basalt coming out of the ground and then getting into the old uh, Columbia River, which has been around for the last 28 million years, and flowed all the way to the coast. And all the headlands that you have in northern Oregon are all Columbia River basalts from the Dundee Hills. Uh, and then also Shahila Mountain underneath them have got the basalt. So the volcanoes were way over here, but it cooled down in this particular area. Uh, and, and, and so the great debate in the Willamette Valley is what soil produces the best uh, tasting um, Pinot Noirs. Is it the Jory soil, which is on basalt bedrock? Is it the Willa Kenzie soil, which is on the marine sediments? Or is it the Laurelwood soil, which is on the old weathered loess or windblown silt on the basalt bedrock? The valley bottoms, you stay off of it. Those are the Missoula flood sediments. Way too many nutrients in them. They were brought down by the Missoula floods. Uh, and so the, some of the white wines grow very well, but the red wines you want to stress, especially to get the best terroir that you've got. So here are the red hills. Look at how red those soils are. Tells you it's well-drained and very, very old and low in nutrient. Perfect for making great wines. And here is a picture of it, a little bit of A horizon, organic material, but the rest, uh, six, seven feet deep, is the red color. And it is our state soil. And, and so why do we have a state anything? Why do we have a state tree, a state song, uh, a state flower? The state flower is actually uh, blooming right now. The Oregon grape, the yellow colors everywhere. Uh, we are the only state in the United States that has a state nut. And that is, for us native Oregonians, the filbert, or everybody else calls it the hazelnut. The reason is... Uh, um, uh, we we decided the Oregon uh, well Soil Science Society of America in 1990 said we want every state to have a sto state soil, and then we already had five of them at that time. It would highlight agriculture. The reason is every kid in fourth grade gets a little book called the Oregon Blue Book or Washington Blue Book, uh, the California Blue Book, and it has all the state things. What makes their state uh, uh, different from all the others? And they wanted every state to have a state soil, and then 
So uh, I, I was president of the Oregon Soil Science Society, and I embarked. It took me 12 years to get it through the Oregon legislature. And in Oregon, you got to unite the east side with the west side. And in fact, in 2009, it was voted the dumbest bill in the legislature. I was on every talk show in the city of Portland about my dumb bill. But then we realized it's all on basalt. Where did all that magma come from? It came from Eastern Oregon. It came down the Columbia River and, and, and completely solidified on the west side. And then the climate produced the over 15 million years, the red colors that you've got. And when I addressed the legislature, uh, I said, if this is one bill that will unite the east side with the west side. It passed, and now we have a state soil. And here is the uh, concurrent session resolution number three. It, the Jory soil is the official store, state of Oregon, and everybody had signed. Peter Courtney signs it down at the bottom. And so now every kid in fourth grade knows that we have a state soil. Here is, I showed you this soil before. Here's the Willa Kenzie. It's red, but not quite as red. And you got a bottle of wine there. And here are the Pizolites. These are the little BB uh, uh, shots. These are uh, iron, magnesium, uh, silicate concretions that form in the soil. Uh, and so people say, what are the different flavors? Well, I primarily say that the basalt rich soils are primarily red fruits, red raspberries, red plums, red currants, red cherries, strong bouquet, light red color. And that the, the marine sediments, the Willikensee soils, are mostly blackberries and black cherries and black plums and everything, strong finish. And Ken Wright, who was winemaker of the world about seven or eight years ago, he's one of my fans because I, well, I'm a, his major fan because he was the first guy to actually put the soil on the back of all of his bottles of wine. And I, I said, Ken, you're my, my, I'm your fan. And he said, well, Scott, you're my fan because you're the guy that unlocked the secrets of the different terroirs. Uh, and, and so I could put the different soils on. But he said, you're also a geologist. And most geologists get their wine out of boxes. And what do you know about flavors of wine? And there's some truth to that. And he said, no, basalt is primarily fruit-driven colors and marine sediments are more floral and spice and lavender and cola and tobacco and cedar and anise. And there's some truth to that. But I, my favorite definition is Adam Campbell out of Elk Cove. And he actually has vineyards in all three sediments. And he uh, actually markets it as the ter uh, terroir trilogy. Marine sediments, he says, is primarily black cherry and black fruits and silk. Whereas volcanic soils are more red pie cherry and spice and the red fruits. And then laurel wood is kind of in between with blue fruits and earthiness, and I love it. All of the winemakers, will, they know that there are differences, but they have different definitions, and you can have the same too. So that is the story from the Willamette Valley. Umqua down south, oh my God, producing unbelievable great ones. I, I got paid by the Southern Oregon wineries to visit every one of the vineyards down there uh, and to uh, check them out. They said, put together a store in Tempranillo. Yeah, it is intermediate warm down there and the best tempranillo in the united states is being grown uh in southern oregon especially in the roseburg area uh and then they also are, are into the uh they're starting to produce some really good heavy reds uh, down in that area uh and then up in the columbia gorge uh this these are pictures primarily in the hood river area but as you go east it's from burgundy to bordeaux in 40 miles from cool climate all the way up to very hot grapes. Uh, and you actually have old vine Zinfandels being grown in the, uh, the Dalles area. Uh, a wonderful place there. And then Walla Walla Valleys, oh, the heavy reds that they've got out there in Southeast Washington, absolutely wonderful. Uh, and, and so the terroir differences between Oregon and Washington, Washington, primarily Southeast Washington, 95% of the vineyards are grown on the Missoula flood sediments. And you're saying, wait a second, Burns, didn't you just tell us that you've, uh, that you've got way too many nutrients? Yes, but how do they limit their, their ter uh, the, the, um, uh, the development of the, the wines? And, and how do they stress the grapes? They do it through irrigation. They only give enough water just to keep the plants alive, but not too much. And so therefore, all of the energy goes into the grapes. Whereas in the Willamette Valley, 90% of the vineyards are on the upland areas where we use soils to limit the, uh, uh, the growth of the plants and only 10% on the Missoula flood sediments. 
Uh, and, and so, oh, I wanted to tell you, uh, because some of you may be kind of my age, uh, and that is uh, Oregon State has, has a really great enology and viticulture program down there. Uh, and I'm, I'm very close friends with many of the people down there. And this is the land of Pinot here in the Willamette Valley. They have developed a new Pinot uh, that is uh, it's a hybrid grape that acts as an antidiuretic. Anti and it is expected to reduce the number of trips that older people will be able to have to the bathroom every night. Uh, and this is going to be marketed as Pinot More. And so if you are interested in looking for this new type of Pinot grown in the Willamette Valley, be sure to head down to Fred Meyers or Thriftway or whatever uh, to ask for some of those. So if you fell asleep at the beginning, uh, what did I talk about um, in this terroir? My aim in life to turn everybody into a terroirist. There are eight factors that are going to affect the flavors of the wine. The first six are terroir, and those are the climate, the geology, uh, the soils, the uh, uh, orientation, the elevations, uh, that all will affect the soil biota. Uh, but then the, the, uh, you also need to, if you're going to be comparing things, you got to keep the winemaker consistent in those cases. In the Willamette Valley, we control the vigor through old soil. Southern Oregon, Eastern Washington, primarily through irrigation. And the Willamette Valley is primarily cool climate grapes, the Pinots and German styles, and Chardonnay. Whereas Eastern Washington uh, is primarily the big heavy rents. Uh, and, and so with this talk, oh, and, and, and my aim in life is to, every time you go into a tasting room, you're going to ask the, the people behind the desk, you know, what is the year because, uh, of, of the bottle that you are tasting me? Uh, because in the old days, especially where we, uh, you know, the climate is getting warmer and warmer, but in the, the old days, like in the 90s, you only have two or three good years in that 10 years. Now it's like eight out of the 10. Uh, and, and so you want to know what those are. What are the clones and what is the soil? Is it a Jory, Willa Kenzie, or Laurelwood? And it is, is it one of the Pomard and Vadensville, the traditional clones for the uh, Pinot Noirs? Or it is a, a, a Dijon clone, 777-114, uh, uh, or Vadensville or um, uh, Pomard, which are the traditionals? And so with this, I would like to, I would like to uh, uh, christen all of you, terroirists, go forth and ask the questions on terroir. And so at, with that point, I would like to open it up for questions. And then I want to uh, get a chance to actually uh, see some of the wines that you are tasting. So thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. Yes, we are terroirists. I'm sure of it. So I, I'm going to take the privilege of starting off. Um, so I was going to ask you about the AVAs. So I'm really glad that you discussed that because there are so many of them now in Oregon and it gets a little confusing. So I'm going to share what I'm drinking. Um, I originally, Fred and I discovered this wine about three or four weeks ago when we were out in Carlton. And at first we thought maybe this was a rock group. It's called Marshall Davis. And it's hard to see their label um, because it's gray, but it's got three guys on the front of it and they're brothers. And they just make Pinot Noir and um, Chardonnay and Rosé. And then they, using grapes from Walla Walla, they make Syrah and Cabernet Sauvignon. We just fell in love with it. So cheers everyone. Feel free to raise your hands, Nancy, or I will call on you to ask Scott questions. So before we go on, can I just comment on Marshall Davis? Sure. I mean, it's a small world. I mean, the father of the three Marshall and Davis boys was my roommate at Stanford. Oh my uh, gosh. I mean, Bob, uh, Bob Marshall, <laughs> he, he was a baseball player and his oldest son, Sean Davis, is the head winemaker right his number two son is uh uh runs the the whole winery and the wine tasting and everything like that and the youngest son is a professional golfer uh and so i mean so i'm a member of their wine club i love all of their uh wines their chardonnay is one of my favorites that oh, there. And i too. love the the grapes that they're getting from eastern washington so um, and and their so the, their pinots and their chardonnays are all grown on Willakenzie soil, so marine sediments. 
so I can't believe you chose Marshall <laughs> Davis. I mean, that's amazing because Bob and I are best buddies. So, that is too amazing. Yeah. All right, so okay. We're at, and somebody asked a question about uh, a terroir in the chat about terroir of chocolate. You know, coffee and terroirs will produce different uh, types of beans uh, and they will have different flavors. Yeah. Not in the milk chocolate as much as it is in the dark chocolate, but they do have different flavors. So, okay, so so what are, uh, tell me some additional people and what they're drinking. I'm, oh, I see uh, the from Salem. Oh, I'm from Salem, Oregon, and I moved um, to a different house about one year ago and it had no landscape. So we've had to learn about the soil. Lo and behold, Jory, Jory Hill. Yeah. And I am um, drinking a Willamette Valley Vineyard. Do you know Jim Berno? I bet you do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whole cluster Pinot Noir from Willamette Valley Vineyard. It's just a few, not even two miles away, probably. So I, in 1984, he came to our AUW cooking group, Jim did, and said, I'm going to start a winery in Salem. And we all sort of looked at each other and kind of thought a winery in Salem, what are you talking about? And it was his initial, you know, venture, just raising capital for his project. So it's been very fun to live here all these years. And it is, you know, you know what it is. It is uh, kind of a corporate um, entity, I think, at this point. But um, it's been very interesting to see that evolve. And then we feel, you know, I feel like we're real close to Yamhill County and that's where we go to wine taste. So a uh, great job. Jim Bruneau is a very close friend. I suspect uh, and, so. And, and his winery is the second wine, biggest winery in the state of Oregon. Mm -hmm. He is an unbelievable uh, entrepreneur. He mm -hmm. has a great set of winemakers. Oh my God, can they make wines? And he has great diversity in the terroir. And I give a, uh, generally every other year a talk on terroir differences uh, for him down there and for their wine club. Uh, and so, uh, and the, I love their whole cluster um, ones where they- I do too, I do too. That's what I got tonight. They have a few more tannins in it. It's really good. So. Uh, and it's on Jory soil. So after we passed the Jory soil as the state uh, soil, he had a big Jory f soil fest down there. And I was the speaker down there at his wonderful winery. And it's, it, and people can become, uh, you know, buy shares in it. Yes. And it gives you, um, uh, you, you'll never get your money out of it, but you get a lot of free wine tasting and it's absolutely great. So yeah. And they're opening a tasting room and restaurant in Lake Oswego. They are. They are. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, yes. he, he's quite an entrepreneur. So thank he you. He really Nancy. is. Yeah. I loved your I loved your lecture, by the way. It was wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else? Georgia, yeah. tell us what you're drinking. Georgia. Uh, I, I just picked up my, my wine club wine from Danson Vineyards in um, outside of Jacksonville. And I'm drinking uh, Pinot Noir Melodia. Um, I have been drinking, we have been, my husband and I have been drinking wine since 1968 when we started dating and used to spend our weekends in the Napa Valley. So we have been drinking our way through the Napa Valley when it was very young and it was very friendly. And so when we moved up here to Oregon, we started doing the same thing in the Applegate Valley. And it was very nice and similar to Napa with no tasting fees and quite lovely. Um, and we do like Applegate Valley wines quite well. Thank you for that. First of all, one of my favorite wineries in Southern Oregon is Danson. And that's what you have here. He <laughs> really is into um, uh, terroir. And, and a lot of times he will uh, have uh, source grapes from the Willamette Valley and compare it to his Pinot Noirs because he's on the South side of the Rogue Valley, so it's cool. Uh, and, and so it's perfect for making really, really good Pinot Noirs. A wonderful guy uh, who runs that there. And then I agree with you in the Applegate. As you get over into the Applegate, you get a little warmer and they you get into the heavier reds and they have been producing some absolutely wonderful, great wines up there. So great choice. Thank you for bringing that forward. Thank you.
Who's next? It looks like Sandy Cameron. I have to unmute myself. Well, I like, um, I'm kind of new to drinking wine. And so I like the Del Rio um, wine, the, the um, Rosé, Rosé Jubilee, that's my favorite. So um, I just started with AAUW going to wineries and, and going to tasting. So I'm, I'm very interested in, in the lecture and, and the influence that the um, soil has on the wine. I didn't realize that. Well, thank you, Sandy. And you mentioned Del Rio Vineyard. So yeah. this is in the north side of the Rogue Valley. So they mm -hmm. have hot, they have some of the hottest vineyards in Southern Oregon. And they, they are an old established vineyard area. And, and so they are, uh, the older the vineyard, the more complexity in the wines. Their heavy reds are absolutely great. I love their rosé uh, because every year it changes. It, it depends upon which red grape is going to go into that. But Del Rio is absolutely a wonderful one. That's north side of the uh, of the um, Rogue River Valley. And uh, so thank you very much for doing that. So thank you. Well <laughs> and Mary Pat, I think you had your hand up earlier. Uh, yeah, I did. Thank you very much. This has really, really been quite interesting. I'm one of these, you know, I, I don't know anything about it, but I know what I'd like kind of people, uh, uh, ashamedly, because I would like to know more, but I didn't grow up on the West Coast, so I had had not had the, the influence. Um so actually, I have two questions, one related to, well, any wine, but you said only 20% of the wine, of the taste of the wine, is related to the winemaker. So am I to presume that if the same grapes are, are being grown in the same terroir, that, but they t the wines taste differently, it's because of the winemaker or can there still be other factors? Exactly. And so um, the 20% uh, you know, th that was that quote of Dick Erath. Okay. That is in a good year in the Willamette Valley in a wet year. Oh, it's about 70% uh, winemaker because they have to try and save the grapes mm -hmm. because they, uh, because a lot of times the uh, number percentage of sugar is only 18, 19 percent, and they got to get up to 23, 24. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they have more hang time. And then you have to, you're going to have some uh, uh, funguses and stuff like that on the grapes. And so you, it, it is a lot of work uh, for the winemaker. And so the winemaker uh, now in a good year, like in the last 10 years, we've had eight of the 10 years have been wonderful years in the Willamette Valley. The winemaker just kind of sits back and just lets the wines make themselves and it's been wonderful. But then there have been a couple of these intense wet years and and uh, and the winemaker has to come through. Uh, and so uh, so so that so that's the answer to that question. Thank you. And then the second one if I may um I, I'd be interested in any comments you had on wines grown around Cape Town, South Africa. And I will just make a comment. I've spent some time there. And one of the things I love about the wineries there is that they, you can get a full several course meal served with, with different wines, of course, to go with the courses on the grounds of the wineries, which is really quite lovely. And I, I don't know of any place on, uh, in the United States where you can do that. But anyway, I'm curious to know what you might have to say about the wines in Cape Town. I love the wines from South Africa. And I've had a chance three times to uh, actually give talks in the, in the, uh, the two Stellenbosch area, uh, mm -hmm. for instance. Uh, their wines are absolutely great. They're, they're essentially um, heavy, uh, warm, warm um, climate grapes that you've got down there. Uh, and th there are quite a few that have restaurants. Now, in the Willamette Valley, many of our wineries now are having restaurants and mm -hmm. you can get food in them. And this is the, you know, we talked about Willamette Valley Vineyards, great what restaurant that is there. And you're seeing this change 
Well, it, it, in the last two years with COVID, the, the restaurants haven't done very well. As we get out of COVID, you're going to see all of these restaurants uh, growing in size and everything. Um, I love I, the one neat thing about South Africa is the price of the wines. I still remember uh, the last time I was there and, um, and my wife and I were staying right next to the university in Cape Town. And we went to the same little restaurant every night and they had a 30 page uh, wine list. There, the only two were outside the countries. The, the first 28 pages were in the country. So we, the first night we went to the Cabernet page to the one that had the most gold medals. And those bottles were $18 a piece. I mean, the cost of the wines were so great. And so you can go to South Africa and get incredibly wonderful wines for cheap prices. So, and the people are wonderful. And the, the vineyards are just gorgeous. So I totally understand what you're you're talking about. So, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Mary Pat, for your two questions. And, uh, and what wine were you uh, drinking? Oh gosh, I don't remember because it's been a few years since since we. Had oh, what are you drinking tonight? Oh, tonight, I <laughs> ashamedly I did not really come prepared. I'm drinking a Cobb Franc, and it's a California Cobb Franc, but I can't tell you right now where exact the winery. I just didn't. I didn't pay attention. I just poured and drank. So I apologize. That's okay. That's what this is about. So I know Charlene Voitilla has a question and she is a vineyard owner. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Well, first of all, with regard to the Mary Pat's question about winemakers, uh, several years ago, before we moved up here, when we were visiting, one of the wineries had a three pack where they took the exact same grapes and they divided them into three and had three different winemakers make the wine and they sold it as a three pack. And it was quite interesting. We had a, a dinner with some friends and you really could tell a difference. So that was kind of keeping all the other factors the same. But uh, as far as what I am drinking tonight, um, I assume that you're familiar with uh, Marsh Vineyard up at the Big Red Barn at the top of Dundee Hill. I mean, it's one of the oldest around. It's yeah, one of the oldest. Well, this is uh, Jim Arterberry Marsh. His new label, it's called Tan Fruit. Um, and it is our 2019 Voitilla Vineyard uh, Chardonnay. And um, he said that uh, um, much of the fruit for the, the Marsh wines are sourced from older estate vines and so forth. But he founded uh, Tan Fruit. Uh, where he's purchasing fruit from other wineries. And he says it gives him a lot more things to play with that he couldn't do with their main label. And so one of those was was um, our, um, our, our Chardonnay. We're in the Chehala Mountains, AVA. Uh, and this is from uh, Dijon 76 and 96 clones and Jory Soil. And it got 97 points from the Wine Advocate. It was just uh, released not too long ago. And let's see, I can't tell all these things, but it says... It has a stunning perfume of quince paste and mushrooms, pastry and flowers, and the palate is satiny, plush and pure with a seamless tangy streak and a long, powerful finish. So I don't know. Bottom can't up. wait to taste it. I know. Yeah. Charlene, I can't wait to uh, taste it too. If people, first of all, have to realize that, you know, the, the numbers that you have for, uh, for wines, you got a 97. Hardly anybody ever gets a 97 on a 100 point scale. Even if you get a 92, that is phenomenal. 93 is no, unbelievable. No. A 97 is superb. And also, uh, Oregon is making Chardonnay a different style. Uh, we had to because I still remember when I came back to Oregon in 1990, um, everybody was beavering off all of the Rieslings, Gewürztraminer, Mueller, Turgor, uh, and Char uh, Chardonnays, and and grafting on uh, uh, Pinot Gris because Pinot Gris was getting twelve dollars a bottle, and nobody was buying the others at six. Uh, and, and the reason is we were using the California clone uh, out of Davis, and which you know Californians make an incredible Chardonnay, which is beautiful colors, heavily malolactic, that buttery. Uh, 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 approach that you've got, but it's, it they have to ha you have to have the heat units. We don't have the heat units here in Oregon, 
So we, so David Adelsheim went back to Burgundy and got the Burgundy <coughs> clone, and that's what we are now growing all of ours. And so we're producing a Burgundy style Chardonnay, not a California style, and we are winning uh, big awards. And so, first of all, congratulations on the '97. That is unbelievable. It's on a Jory soil. That's wonderful. Uh, and uh, Mars, the, the, the vineyard, I mean, is, is just unbelievable. Um, so congratulations. I well, and I actually, he makes six different Chardonnays under the tan fruit label. We got the least number of points. The other one's got 98s and 99s. Wow. So you might want to go tasting. I think oh, yeah. That's wonderful. So congratulations. Yeah. We Thanks, love Jim. Thank you. Anybody else want to share what they're oh, we drinking? Got, we've oh. got two hands raised virtually. Okay. Mickey. Mickey. Hi there, everyone. <laughs> oh, this has been wonderful. I haven't participated in one of these before. Uh, first of all, um, I'm from West Salem. Um, history wise, I started drinking wine when I was five <laughs> up in Portland. <laughs> My, my parents met and married in France and they were there their first two years in Poitiers and uh, they brought me up enjoying wine with dinner. Um, so I've been drinking wine for quite a while. <laughs> uh, after we moved uh, from Portland to the Walla Walla Valley in the late 60s. And so we were in the Walla Walla Valley for when the, the vineyards took off, we lived about a quarter of a mile from Leonetti Cellars, and we had Leonetti wines <laughs> at our holiday meals. So we we were kind of spoiled. So that's a little bit of my background, but I do sincerely love my big reds, hearty reds. And since coming to Oregon in 2010, I've struggled a bit to find ones that I'm I'm used to. Um, uh, one of the ones I used to like was, let's see, who was talking about the Cabernet Franc? I used to like uh, Walla Walla Vintner's Cabernet Franc quite a bit. Um, so a couple of comments I just wanted to make here. One was about climate. I noticed, uh, Scott, oh, and thank you so much for your informative presentation. I have studied some geology myself, and I really appreciated uh, your presentation very much. But the climate table that you showed, I believe was from 2005, and we've seen a lot of changes since then. So, and I've talked to a number of uh, uh, white, you know, vineyard owners and about some of the challenges they're seeing with our drier, warmer climate and which, which uh, varietals they're, they're changing to. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to ask you a question about that and comment on that for one. Um, and then also related, related kind of to climate and taste. I was uh, at a taste, I was at Cardwell Hill Cellars out of Philomath uh, earlier this winter. And I don't, I don't remember what I was tasting. I think it was a Pinot Gris, but it had this odd smoky finish to it. And I asked uh, the owner who was there, and I said, are, are you throwing some charcoal in here or what? And he said, no, those grapes are from we when we had the fires. Mm -hmm. And it was just a hint of that smokiness at the end. And I just thought it was really, really interesting. Um, I don't really have anything else to add. It was just a couple of comments. <laughs> It gives me a chance to uh, make about four or five comments. Uh, it's amazing. So thank you very much. And uh, um, first of all, you mentioned Poitiers, France. My sister went uh, went to Oregon State, and she did her junior year abroad in Poitiers. And so I've been to Poitiers, and it's a great place. I love Leonetti. Oh, my God, you mentioned Leonetti. Big, heavy reds, uh, southeast Washington. Phenomenal. You talked about climate change. And, and and the the chart that I had for the all the different areas still stays the same. Cool climate is still de, uh, uh, defined by those those uh, boundaries and intermediate warm, warm and hot. It doesn't. But what happens is as the climate is warming and it is warming, you move from the type of grapes into the next one. So in the Willamette Valley, we are now at the edge of cool climate. Uh, and so many of the winemakers in their lowest elevation vineyards are now plant, planting uh, cool climate, um, 
cool climate. Uh, uh, can't remember. Uh, but, uh, but Tempranillo. Tempranillo is going to be there, and then uh, uh, and and so you're starting to see some of the cool uh, the, the next type of grapes that are there being planted at the lower elevations, and they're ripening. Uh, Greg Jones, who put that together, uh, gave a talk a few years ago. He said in 20 years in the Napa Valley, it's going to be so hot, they'll only be growing Chardonnay, or Zinfandel, and it's going to be so hot. Wow. And so what you do is your region, you move to the next type of grape. I mean, uh, um, um, Champagne is northern France, cool climate. It's now too hot. For the cool climate, so all the shard, uh, all of the uh, uh, houses okay. there are now buying property in England, and the champagne mm -hmm. they are producing equal amounts in of champagne in England as compared to northern France because northern France is too warm for that, and so you've got to shift around, and so climate is a big deal. Uh, and then uh, we just last month had the annual um, wine uh, symposium for the state of Oregon. Over a thousand people get together. The number one attended symposium was on smoke. And, and because smoke is really, really difficult. It, it, you can't get it off. You can't wash it off the grapes. It ruins your crop. Uh, and I, I have bottles of... Um, from Phelps Creek, which is up in um, Hood River. And remember a few years ago when we had the big fire in the gorge? Well, the fire got within uh, one mile of his place, completely inundated all this. His best uh, uh, pinots, he made a uh, six barrels, and he calls it calamity. And I, and when I do wine tastings, uh, I do it. And everybody said, wow, this would go great with barbecue. Uh, and, you know, the winemakers and the wine tasters do not like it. It's called uh, smoke tainting. Uh, and, and we're trying to deal with that. Oregon State is really, really working on that. Uh, and that's a big deal. So thank you for bringing up about smoke. Thank you for bringing up why, uh, uh, climate change. Willamette Valley is set for life because as the temperature rises up, we'll just move into the next group of the cabs, Merlots, Syrahs. And it's cool climate uh, Syrah that they are planting at the lowest elevations. So thank you very much, thank Mickey, you. for your comments. Thank you. I see Sue Klumpf has her hand up. She's our co-president, Scott, for the state of Oregon. Sue lives in Grants Pass. Hi, Scott. Yep, I'm Southern Oregon, Applegate Valley area. We have a lot of great wineries in our area. But I was gonna make a comment about the smoke. Um, Forest Vineyards in Cape Junction, one of their biggest sellers was after the biscuit fire. They did a flyover red, which was a blend. And that, I mean, that was their top seller for a long time. But, and that smoke, it just gave it just enough that it was unique and won quite a few awards. But, wow. And I, I love Forest Vineyards. And I uh, too. the winemaker there is just absolutely great. They produce a huge amount of wine down there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I've got a chance to actually sit down with the wine, uh, the owner and, and taste some of his wines. And so so right now, everybody is, you know, wondering what to do with grapes that have the smoke tainting. He and, and, and for instance, Phelps, Phelps Creek turned something that was a disaster into something positive. And so thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, the Applegate Valley, again, where you are, wonderful, wonderful wines. So Can I ask we you have a quick question. Just one question, real quick. You've mentioned so many, and you've tasted millions of wines in your life. Would it be too much to ask you if you had a favorite winery, or would that be imposing too much? Well, I get asked that an awful lot. Tonight, I'm actually drinking Pinot Blanc, uh, and this is from Elk Cove. I, Pinot Blanc is just, uh, and this got a 93 in, in the Wine Spectator, which I think is very, very good. <laughs> Um, and so every day is different. And, and so, yeah, I, I've got my top five ones, uh, for the Willamette Valley, Southern Oregon. I've got my favorite one down, uh, Abacella is my favorite one in Southern Oregon. I think that they are just producing unbelievably great, um, wines of all, and the best Tempranillo I think in the United States comes out of there. Uh, and, and so, uh, yeah, uh, people have mentioned a lot of my favorite wineries tonight. And I've got maybe a, a top 100, um, and so I really can't go in, into that. But every place 
it, it is different. I mean, up in, in Hood River, Phelps Creek, uh, Y East are a couple of my favorites that are up in that area. And then in the Willamette Valley, uh, Stoller, uh, Jory Soil is a great one, Shehalem, um, uh, also um, Ribbon Ridge uh, are, are other ones. Um, I mean, there's so many. And Elk Cove I talked about before, and this is an Elk Cove Pinot Blanc. So thank you for those uh, questions. And thanks Scott, for we have a member here from California, Bev. Uh, have you got any questions or comments you'd like to add? No, this was just absolutely wonderful. Scott, my husband and I grow our own grapes when we had our, because California, we have to be careful about water, obviously, in Southern Cal and really near Los Angeles. And uh, so what we did is we had it landscaped. So again, it's, south, it's facing the south and uh, Southern exposure. And we have uh, Chardonnay, Sangiovese, and uh, Cab. And my husband and a guy that he went to uh, medical school with, they get together. And I mean, cause it, they're so geeky. I love it. And I love hearing you. It's like our geeky friends, <laughs> they, they get into it, you know? And uh, my husband spraying the grapes with, and I wish I could remember the name of it. It's all organic because he doesn't want any of the insects. I mean, we were gonna start bees too, you know, having a beehive anyway. But you know, the thing that's cool is when uh, and for anybody who's new to wine tasting, every time we go, and we've been doing it for over 30 some years, we learn something new, something new. And that includes brewing and what, whatever. You ask what I'm drinking, I had no Viognier, Viognier. it's not something that's gonna stay very long, but what I'm drinking is Westward whiskey from Portland. Okay, <laughs> sorry, <That's laughs> couldn't okay. find the <laughs> Westward whiskey, phenomenal. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of what we're doing. We've got a couple of big glass barrels right now of uh, wine that's percolating. But uh, we tended to have um, because the way it's on like a like a grade. The, the vines, the roots have to really work to get the water. So they're going down and they really have to work to get it. I can't tell you how many pounds of grapes we had last September for harvest. I mean, we don't have a lot, eight or nine, you know, vines, but oh, wow, what fun. Um, and we also had an opportunity. My second language is Serbo-Croatian. When we went up to Napa, I had the privilege of meeting um, my Gurgic. Okay, who did the, the you, you remember the, um, what was it, the blind taste testing in France, right? And uh, for his Chardonnay. So I, I'm talking to him in Serbo Croatian and then trying to interpret to my husband what a treat that was. I mean, just, just to try and taste. And I think his daughter Violet is, is doing that now, but we just have fun. And this is just a fun thing to do. And Scott, thank you so much. This is incredible. Well, I have fun doing that. And so thank you. And you mentioned a whole bunch of things. One of my favorite white wines is Viognier, uh, and, uh, which is wonderful. And we really haven't mentioned that tonight. It is a warm climate grape. Uh, it does not grow in the Willamette Valley. Uh, uh, so the best Viognier in the Pacific Northwest comes from Southern Oregon or Eastern Washington. And the interesting thing is, uh, the Eastern Washington and Southern Oregon, uh, the flavors are incredibly different. And, yes. uh, and I, and, and so it's always fun to deal with that. One of the fun things about being wine tasting, et cetera, is geeking out. And you mentioned that because, and that, and that's why next year at, at the, the state wine co uh, conference, I'm going to be giving a talk uh, for the wine tasting people, because we have the people that come out and wine taste and go from wine age, they want to know all this little amount of stuff. What's the soil? What's the year? Uh, how did the winemaker use this and what is happening in the vineyard and all of those things. Those are all geeky types of things. And they pre produce different flavors. And then it's neat to be able to taste that um, you know, when you're done. Water is a huge, huge deal. Where are you going to get? Southern Oregon right now is having a huge problem because the irrigation district has cut all the vineyards off from the water this year. I mean, there's just no water down there in the, uh, uh, and, and so it is a huge, huge problem down there. Uh, uh, and a good friend of mine who owns nine vineyards down there, he said, Scott, I'm barely going to have little tiny grapes. Now, the intensity is going to be great, but the volume is not going to be there. 
Uh, and so it's for the Willamette Valley is never going to be a problem because we will continue to get the, um, the the water units that we have based on all the models. Southern Oregon and California, oh, they're going to have huge problems with the water, and that is going to be a problem down there. And then uh, you also uh, mentioned about organic too. Uh, and, and in Oregon, more and more of the wineries are becoming more organic. And I think that that's great because that's an Oregon thing to do that. And uh, um, so thank you very much for your comments. So I think we have time for one more question. Is there anybody else that wants to either share their wine or um, ask a question? Thank you so much, Scott. You've done so many talks for me, but this is one of the highlights. I think everyone had a great time. And Marty, gave us... Marty did raise her hand. Oh, Marty, she did. did you I make didn't a see comment? it. Marty, did you want to make a comment? Yes, I have us unmuted. Oh, sorry. All right. So, any rec? I'm going to be in Eugene next week. Any recommendations for tasting in that area? Um, just south of Eugene, well, there, there are a whole bunch of, of vineyards that are down there, uh, but yeah. south of Eugene has some really, really good ones that you get down there. Uh, and a, a few years ago, we uh, widened up the AVA for the Willamette Valley to include um, King Estates. Oh. And I think uh, King Estates it produces one, one of the best Pinot Gris in the United yeah. States period. Uh, but then their, their, their Pinot Noirs and other wines are absolutely really, really good. Yes. And so that's one of my favorites down there. But there are so many other ones. And then then you get over uh, to the east, you know, the west side of the Willamette Valley. So mm -hmm. west of Eugene, you got that's this new ABA, Long Tom, where the Long Tom River is. And I, I can't wait to go down and try some of the, the, the wines that are down in that area, too. So Eugene has quite a few wineries down there. And, uh, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the uh, all the information. It's a wealth of information. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you to, for all the questions. I apologize for the, the problems at the beginning with all of the uh, getting the share screen and not share screen and everything like that. And I'm glad it worked out that the, I got through uh, what I wanted to talk about. I love the questions. Loved hearing what everybody was drinking and all of your opinions on everything. And I learned a whole bunch too. So uh, Pat, thank you very much for the uh, invitation to come and talk to the group tonight and uh, keep on trucking to everybody and go out as terroirists and uh, ask those questions when you go to the wine tasting areas. Cheers, everyone. Thanks again, Scott. And don't forget, I have that special bottle of Walla Walla Viognier for you. I'm saving it. I hope it's not getting too old. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you very much, Pat. Thanks so Nick, again, Scott. Thanks everybody for coming. I hope you all had as much fun oh, as I did. Yes. And learned something that. new. Mm -hmm. All right. Yep. Bye -bye. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye. Cheers. <laughs>